The purpose of this lecture is to help you understand the different metrics that are used to evaluate working capital management. You've already seen the measures of cash cycle, but let's review those for a moment. There's the operating cycle and the cash conversion cycle. In general, the longer the cycle, the greater the need for liquidity. So Boeing, which has a long production line, which has a a large inventory at any point in time of the aircraft that are in process would have greater need for liquidity than say a grocery store chain that turns over their goods quite quickly into cash. So the operating cycles length the time it takes to take a company's investment in cash and turn it back into cash so it's a cash to cash cycle. If we look at this in terms of the cycle here, we're, we invest in inventory, we sell the inventory on credit, collect on accounts receivable, and then when the cash comes in, the company can either repay some of the short-term financing, invest in more inventory, or can uh, keep the cash on hand to help with the next part of the seasonal cycle. In terms of equations, the operating cycle is the sum of how long it takes to convert inventory into sales and how long it takes to collect on receivables. So it's the sum of the inventory conversion period and the receivable collection period, which in notation it's the DIO, the day's inventory outstanding, plus the day's sales outstanding. The cash conversion cycle considers the fact that company may not pay for their own inputs immediately, but it may take them time to pay for these um, through the use of trade credit. So they may buy something to put on the shelf, but they may not have to pay their vendor immediately. They may have to pay in 30 days or 60 days or whatever is customary. So the cash conversion cycle takes the operating cycle and then subtracts the amount of time that cash is freed from the payables. This is also called the net operating cycle and the day's working capital. The cash conversion cycle is therefore the sum of the day's inventory outstanding, the day's sales outstanding, and then we subtract the day's payables outstanding. The day's inventory outstanding is a comparison of the amount invested in inventory at a point in time with the average day's cost of goods sold. The inventory ideally is going to be a figure that represents the typical or average during the period we're evaluating. If we're using balance sheet figures, say at the end of a fiscal year, these would be biased because this is the low point of the operating cycle, so ideally we'd like quarterly figures or weekly if we could have those. Internal to a firm, we would have this information and get a better view of the inventory outstanding during the period. The DIO is also number, known as the number of days inventory, the average inventory period, and the inventory holding period. And it is the inverse of the inventory turnover. So if the inventory turnover is 12 times a year, then the day's inventory outstanding will be approximately 30. Day sales outstanding uses counts receivable and compares it to credit sales per day. Same problem with the inventory balance. We probably want to know some type of average over a period of time as opposed to the end of quarter, but sometimes we simply don't have the anything but an end of quarter or end of fiscal year number. And then we would use that and divide by credit sales divided by 365, so that's credit sales per day. If we were an analyst from the outside looking at a company, they, we wouldn't have an idea of what those credit sales would be, and we'd estimate it from customary practices in the industry. If we were internal to a firm evaluating our own collection policies, then we would have a much better idea, of course, of what credit sales would be. This is called the average collection period. If you have credit terms of, say, 110 net 30, you would expect that uh, the day sales, sales outstanding would be close to 30. You wouldn't really expect it to be under 30 because there will be delinquent accounts. So it will somewhere, hopefully, in the neighborhood of 30. 
and uh, deviations would need to be explored. And the uh, day sales outstanding is the inverse of the accounts receivable turnover. In a similar manner, we calculate the day's payable outstanding, comparing the accounts payable balance from the balance sheet with the average purchases per day. Now, you're not going to find purchases on a financial statement, but you can infer purchases from the basic accounting relationship that beginning inventory plus purchases is equal to cost of goods sold plus ending inventory. So given three of those pieces, you could back into purchases given a balance sheet and an income statement. Days payable outstanding, referred to as the average payables period, and the number of days payables, and it's the inverse of the accounts payable turnover. We can see a comparison between 2009 and 2010 for IBM. The inventory turnover has improved. The days inventory outstanding, which means has declined, which means that less is tied up in inventory. The accounts receivable turnover has increased, which means less is tied up in receivables, so they're collecting a bit faster in 2010 than 2009. And the accounts payable turnover has declined, so they're tying up more in payables, which actually is a benefit to the company because it means that they're freeing up that capital that could be used elsewhere in the firm by not paying immediately and actually paying a little bit longer in 2010 than 2009. The result of all this is an operating cycle which has declined from 2009 to 2010 and a cash conversion cycle that has declined as well. This is generally what we expect as the economy is recovering. Business is picking up so there's more turnover in inventory. Customers are able to pay more on time perhaps. And so there's more business going on and a credit is acceptable, so IBM has been able to pay a little bit longer without any difficulty. So we have an improvement in their cash situation in terms of a shorter cycle, which means that less need for liquidity. Now this is still a much longer cycle than a lot of other companies and a lot of different industries, so you really want to look at a trend over time for this company, but also compare it to other companies in the same industry. And days sales outstanding is a number that could be managed. Like all the of these days numbers that we're talking about, there's you know good and bad about using these, and we're going to focus on days sales outstanding. If you sell goods at a discount, you will increase your days sales outstanding. If you accept poor credit risk, you're going to increase your days sales outstanding. So you can't just look at days sales outstanding and say, hey, it increased, and the company's doing more business, and that's a good thing because it may be actually that they're ta have, assuming more risk in terms of riskier credit that they're extending. And it could mean that uh, they're sacrificing a bit of prof profitability by providing more discounts. And day sales outstanding is going to be affected by the ups and downs of company sales. So sometimes it's difficult to use it in actually evaluating a credit policy. For example, if you say, you know, the credit terms are net 30, but if you look throughout a year, you might see quite a bit of changes given a firm with seasonal operations. There are two alternatives that are suggested for uh, day sales outstanding. One is the best possible day sales outstanding. The other is the collection effectiveness index. The best possible day sales outstanding looks like what you were used to, but instead of using total receivables, we just use the current portion. So if the credit terms are 110 at 30, then we're talking about those that are 30 days or less in terms of age. So those are the current receivables. So you're using the current receivables, not the overdue receivables. And the goal is to get your DSO close to the best possible DSO. It means that you have a more effective collections policy. Another more common measure that's used in practice is the Collections Effectiveness Index, the CEI. This is a comparison of collections uh, relative to what has come due. What you do is you have, if you compare the numerator and denominator of this equation, 
Okay, both have the beginning receivables. Both have credit sales divided by n. Now n is the number of periods. If I were evaluating beginning and ending for a given month, n would be 1. If I wanted to do it over 3 months, n would be 3. So n is the number of days, the number of months, depending on what metric you want to use. And then you have the, the difference between the numerator and denominator is that the numerator has the total receivables and the denominator has the current receivables only. Those say if your terms are 110 net 30, so those would be those 30 days or less. If it's close to 100%, it means collections are very effective, and a low CEI indicates poor collections. Now, some users will take this number and actually multiply 100 to make it a true index. So, above 1 versus below, I'm sorry, close to 1 versus uh, close to 0 would be the comparison. Let's take a brief example here. We've got sales for October, November, and December. We've got the beginning and ending accounts receivable balance. And then for each of these ending balances, we have the breakdown by age. And the current is the what's within our credit policy terms. That's the 5,000, 5,100, and 5,200, and so on. And so we have the delinquent accounts, which are the three rightmost columns. To calculate the CEI just for October, we would take the 6,000 beginning, and the 10,000, we're just doing one month, so n is 1. And then we subtract in the numerator the total accounts receivable, and the denominator, so we subtract only the current. That gives us a rating of 85.91%. Now, in and of itself, it doesn't, you know, it, it's, we can't say, you know, close or not close here, but we can look at a trend. So, for example, if you were to perform this calculation for November and December, in November, you'd see a CEI of 86.91%, and in December, you'd see 91.6%. If you were to calculate this over the entire three months, it'd be 89.34%. But by looking at the individual months, what we see is actually an improvement. So 85.91% to 91.6%. So we have an improvement in the collection, which is you know, positive trend. We're improving our effectiveness of collections. Now just to give you comparison, the day sales outstanding for October are 20, and the best possible day sales outstanding is 15.5. So that give you an idea of how those measures stack up, and of course we would like our day sales outstanding to be as close to 15 and a half as we could get. So this concludes the metrics discussion on working capital.